What emotion do you feel when you're going to approach someone you're very attracted to and there's an extremely high probability that she's going to tell you to disappear? <laughs> right, exactly, absolutely, because it's a real judgment, right? We're going to see a movie called Crumb where you'll see this in great detail. But it's a real judgment. It's like the best judgment is, well, I don't mind your physical presence, but your genes should definitely not survive another generation. <laughs> Right, and that's sort of generally translated into, I think we should just be friends. <laughs> right, you know, and you can blow that off, and people do, and you have to, because it's part of being polite and civilized, but, you know, let's make no mistake about it. There is no more fundamental judgment than that. So, paralysis, and there's no shortage of men, I mean, who are absolutely terrified of women. I mean, I've had many of them in my practice, you know, I had... One guy, he was so terrified of women, he couldn't even talk to them on the phone. It's more common than you think. So, but it's generally manifested by men who, do, who no one cares about, so it's generally irrelevant. So, well, it's the, it's the case. It really is the case. I'm, I'm not kidding. They're low-status men. You know, they're people that are generally regarded as losers. And there isn't anybody who really gives a damn about what happens to them one way or another. And there's a lot more men in that category than there are women. Women are in all sorts of, you know, social categories that cause the misery and distress, but that one seems to be predominantly male. One of the things I'm going to do when we talk about Freud is I'm going to show you this movie Crumb, which I just told you about, and it, it's actually, it's a very rare thing because it shows you the world from the perspective of very intelligent male losers, and that's just not a perspective you ever see because it's the winners that tell the stories about their life, it's like who the hell cares about the life of a loser, but this movie is about a loser who became a winner and you know, almost as an act of revenge and uh, it's great, it's great, great, great uh, examination of the Oedipal complex remarkable, women select men that makes them nature because nature is what selects and so you know, you can think, well it's only symbolic that women are nature, it's like no, it's not just symbolic it's not just symbolic you know, and the woman, in some sense, is the gatekeeper to rep is not in some sense is the gatekeeper to reproductive success, and you can't get more like nature than that. In fact, it's the very definition of nature. So, as I said, there are lots of reasons why these symbolic representations are set up the way they are. All right, so that's the great mother, nature, the queen, the matrix. The matrix is something from which all things form. Same root word as matter, mother. All the same root word. The matriarch, the container, the cornucopia, the object to be fertilized, the source of all things, the fecund, the pregnant. There are more parts of the association network. The strange, the emotional, the foreigner, the place of return and rest. The deep, the valley, the cleft, the cave, hell, death and the grave. The moon, ruler of the night and the mysterious dark. And matter in the earth. So, those aren't necessarily associated with femininity, but they're typically associated with femininity from a symbolic perspective. You know, so like generally, like a witch in a movie doesn't come riding out of the full bright sun at noon, right? That just doesn't happen, because it doesn't make sense. It's a dark thing. And so if you saw that occurring in the light in a movie, you'd think, you know, what the hell's going on here? That doesn't make sense. And the reason it doesn't make sense is because it's, it violates the it violates the complex, the symbolic complex. So, those are female denizens of the underworld and hell. Very pleasant creatures. It's like uh, Medusa with the head of snakes, you know. And if you might, if you ask, you know, why would a woman have a head of snakes in reference to a man? And that's really simple. I bet there are men here who know the answer to that. I don't know what you guys think about this, but I was pretty happy when I thought this up, and it took me a long time. So, if you think about the world in Darwinian terms, Right? It's a struggle for survival and reproduction. Which are basically the same thing. Survival is you, but reproduction is the survival of your genes. So it's a, it's a survival issue over very long spans of time. Okay, what do we call the selection mechanism? Na right, natural selection, right? It's nature who does the selection. Okay, so let me tell you something that makes female humans different than female chimps. I mean, there's lots of things that, that do, but... <laughs> So, but here, here's an important one. If you look at which male in a female in a chimp troop fathers most of the offspring, it's the dominant male. But the reason for that isn't because the female chimps sort of flock around the dominant male. 
Now that happens in other species, but it doesn't happen with chimps. What happens is the dominant male chases all the subordinate males away and will interfere with any sexual behavior they manifest. It'll chase them away. The females, though, are perfectly happy to mate with a subordinate male if they're in heat and they get the opportunity. So they go into heat, which is something that doesn't happen with female humans, and they really don't care who they mate with. Okay, female humans are much different than that. They're picky. So they're, they're are, really, they're choosy. It's a big deal. It's a big deal that they're choosy. Women also seem to evaluate men for their fitness. Now, so, lots of men have no sexual partners and they have no children. That's not the case with women. Almost all women have one child or more. And it's a rare woman indeed who cannot find a sexual partner. Some of you undoubtedly have already experienced what it's like to be possessed by a particularly stupid idea. You know, so maybe you've grown out of one or two of the stupid ideas that possessed you. Or maybe you're possessed by an attraction to someone you can't control, or you can't control your eating behavior, or you, you know, you're a pushover when it comes to interpersonal interactions because you're too agreeable, or you fly off the handle and fight, and, you know, none of this is really under your control. And so all of those things that manifest themselves, not only in your behaviors, but in your perceptions, your perceptions themselves, you know, they tend to take on embodied form and use you as the vehicle for their activity. So, you know, when you're thinking about something like anger, for example, think about how it works, because it's quite peculiar. What must someone generally do? How must someone generally act if you're going to be angry at them? They have to be irritating, right? You know, they have to provoke you in some way. Well, the mere fact that you perceive what they're doing as irritating or provoking doesn't ensure that anyone else would have thought about it as irritating or provoking, or that that's what they meant, or that that's what's happening. And my point is, my point is, it's very important to think about these complexes of ideas as subpersonalities, because otherwise you really don't get what they're like. If you're angry, if you have a proclivity towards anger, especially if it's an unthinking proclivity, anything that someone says might irritate you. And it isn't like they say something and you think about it and then you get irritated. It's like you perceive the person as irritating. You know, maybe it's just the way they hold their mouth or something. It, it, it can be very, very subtle. And you might say, well, it's not me, it's you. It's not that I'm irritated by you. It's that you're irritating. And that, you know, that's a very difficult thing to settle because the reality is somewhere between the subjective and the objective, right? A lot of arguments that you'll have with people throughout your life are about exactly that. Am I, are you irritating or am I oversensitive? It's like, well, you know, we're going to hash that out for a good long time before we figure it out. But the point is, is that if you're possessed by an emotional state or a motivational state or an idea or some kind of complex, you'll see the world through its eyes. And then the facts reveal themselves to you through the lens of that particular set of ideas. So it's a very frightening idea because, you know, we like to think of ourselves as masters of our own house, which is completely clueless because it's obvious if you watch yourself for like a month that you hardly ever do what you tell yourself to do when you're liable to do all sorts of other things that you don't even want to do. You know, because you say, well, I'm going to go to the gym three times a week and I'm not going to drink, you know, and maybe there's this person I'm not going to associate with. And then, you know, you don't go to the gym and you find that person and you go out and drink with them and you think, what the hell's going on, you know? And, but it's, 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 you, you're not the sort of person that will do what you say. And so, like, what sort of person are you? Well, that's a psychoanalytic question. It's a deep one, because you're a peculiar thing. And there's parts of you that are really, really, really old. And you know, the, the sort of naive you, the naive young you that you think of yourself as is like a little piece of flotsam in an ocean of complexity. And the ocean of complexity is you. And part of diving down into the depths is to start to understand what it means to be human. And like, whatever that means, it's the one thing you can say about it for sure is that it's bloody peculiar.